Hi, my name is Sandy Baird, and I'm here with Eric Agnero, and this is our monthly program called What's Happening. It is sponsored by the Vermont Inter Institute of Community and International Involvement, and this once a month we get to talk together with you, sometimes with people abroad, on important current events. The most important event is, appears to me to be the elections in Europe and in Iran. And we have with us an international guest who will analyze and comment on those elections in France, in the UK, and in Iran, if we can figure it all out. So Eric Agnero will begin. Yes, thank you, Sandy. We are joined uh, from London by uh, a political analyst, uh, Manix Manto who uh, has been living in London for the past almost <laughs> 30 years and has a good insight on what went on in the elections in Great Britain. But also, you know, as someone living in Europe, Manix will certainly help us decipher what happened also in France. Right. Two very as much important. as we can. <laughs> as right. much as yeah. we can. Also, oh, shall we uh, bring in our uh, guest? Yes, Maybe. right oh, away. Ma Manix, uh, uh, could you tell us Let's start with uh, England. Yeah. yeah, what happened over there? Why are people so excited about you know this change of power? Uh, uh, thank you, Eric, for having me. Uh, what ha happened in England? It's a resounding taking of responsibilities from uh, the general people after 40, 14 long years of. Uh, the Conservative uh, ruling party, the citizens of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland have decided to change the way they want to see the, the, the country forward. So the Labour Party has won a landslide victory that can be compared almost to the landslide victory of Tony Blair decades back. So this is the people talking to the politics asking them to listen to them instead of listening and making party politics so if i can resume what happened uh last week here in england is that the labor party has won almost 411 seats and they are up 2009 seats from last election in 2019 that is a total gaining from the Conservative Party. So the Conservatives have lost a lot of seats. And something that we can take from this election also is the rise of small parties. Uh, I'm talking about Reform Party, the Green Party. And uh, if you wish, during this uh, uh, program, we can talk more about this. I would like to... What especially interested me was two things. Was the election of Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party at one point, and he ran as an independent against Labour, and yet he won. Um, could you comment on that and tell our viewers and us what all that might mean, that Jeremy Corbyn, against enormous odds, actually, won that seat against the Labour Party? Okay, thank you. Um, something had to be said about uh, the stance taken by Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, as you rightly said, has been the Labour leader party at some point, and is a grassroots politician. Uh, the seat is holding in uh, Islington. He uh, held this seat since the late 80s. So he knows his constituency. He knows his constituents and he knows the politics inside out. The problem with the, the problem, can you hear me? Yeah. The problem with Jeremy Corbyn is not a, a, a question of leadership. It is merely a question of party politics because he put forward some values that the Labour Party was considering uh, being a little bit awkward. It's about uh, anti-Semitism. There was some, some cases of anti-Semitism within the party, 
and it didn't do uh it didn't take uh, it didn't take the um the decision that the party wanted him to take at this time so he's been asked to leave the party and because of his past because he knows the party inside out and because he knows his constituents is being uh, expelled from the party but he stood apart as an independent and one so this is also a, a lesson that uh, party should uh, uh, actually take on board party politics will never be taken into account when the will and the people are into uh, the frame the people will will always prevail on above our party politics that's what i can say about uh, jeremy corbyn uh, winning the election as an independent right. candidate all right let me ask you something more directly jeremy corbyn is very pro-palestinian and very against the current war between israel and the people of gaza uh, and he was accused of his own party when he took that stand of being more pro-palestinian being anti-semitic and he was driven out of the Labour Party. However, he is now okay. back. Do you suppose that the reason that he is back and that he won is because he opposes the war of Israel against Gaza? Is that why he won? And is that the maybe second why question, the people yeah. why the people supported him? Yes. Well, that can be interpreted like this because okay. uh, let's let let's let, let let's let's be honest with ourselves here. Yeah. Um, the party politics have been ru ruling over countries like England for too long. The people have spoken against the war in Gaza, and they have entirely said to the government that uh, the Palestinians are suffering as much as the Ukrainian people are suffering, that all, all this uh, uh, massacre mm -hmm. should stop. But the party policies are governed by many uh, decisions and interests that are not the interest of the people. Coming back to Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn is uh, uh, a man of the people. He's a man of the people mm -hmm. and he's won. We, we can say that he's won because of his stance uh, according uh, to uh, the, the war in Gaza. But it's also the view that he's uh, putting aside because now we have a Labour Party that is going more to the centre while he was more to the left of the Labour Party. So uh, the Labour Party is now very much into the, uh, the field of the Conservatives. So this is also something that many voters are confused with. Jeremy Corbyn is seen as a very leftist uh, politician, while the new uh, Prime Minister that we have, and uh, Sir Kerstama, is at the left centre of the Labour Party. So probably he stands on Gaza, he stands on human rights, mm. he stands of, on socialism, is one of the reasons why he's won as an independent candidate. Okay. okay. Let, let, let's talk now about you know, the rise of uh, small parties and it's like uh, something that we've been seeing across the globe and, and France has also shown that. In England, you know, is it also uh, uh, the case? Is it really the rise of small parties or just you know, something that happened. Uh, uh, is there a real movement of the small parties? You know, uh, is the status quo being, you know, challenged? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, let's not mis be mistaken about what is happening around Europe. Uh, there has been a rise of the small parties, as I've uh, rightly said so. But it's not something that is new. It's not a new phenomenon. It's been underground for quite a long time. Uh, reform, as is now known, is not a new party as such because uh, Nigel Farage, who is the leader of reform, has been in politics under many other names. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not in his own name, but the names of the parties that he was creating. Those uh, uh, people are mainly for national pride, and also for nationalism. They're against Europe, and he was one of the main leaders of the Brexit. So people are just picking up their mind. They are seeing that uh, their condition and their welfare is very, very uh, difficult at the moment, as it is in many European countries. 
and they put this down to the Brexit or from they put down to uh, uh, England or the UK being in Europe. So now Brexit has failed, but Nigel Farage and his party, the Reform Party, are telling now their voters that the Brexit has not been well negotiated. That's one of the reasons why they're still suffering, that they will take uh, the UK completely out of the Europe system financially. We are out. Legally, we are not out because uh, we still are governed by uh, by Europe. Uh, by uh, So this is one of the main reasons why people are thinking that the welfare system, the NHS, and all the suffering of the people is down to a very bad negotiated Brexit. So they're going back to the reform, you know, uh, hoping that reform will bring back the uh, shining days. Maybe, you know, we, we're witnessing, you know, a response to the uh, failed promises of globalization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, in, uh, the English are, you know, uh, repelling uh, uh, the European Union. In France, you know, like, what happened is the result of the uh, European elections. Do you think that uh, uh, NATO and all these alliances that are waging war across the, blo uh, the globe are, you know, uh, being repelled by the citizens? Uh, thank you, Eric. I think this is a very important point that you just yeah. made here. Um, we, it had to be said that what we have now uh, around uh, the world, in Europe and uh, elsewhere, is the, um, is the politics of the countries, while the politics should be done for the people. So the politicians are not really listening to the voice of the people. So what we've seen here in the UK and also in France is a way from the, for the people to tell the politicians to listen to their wills. The value that they are, uh, the politicians are putting up front is the value of humanism, is the value of uh, democracy, but the real democracy has spoken. The real democracy wants more power to the people and not power concentrated in the hands of the uh, elite politicians. This is what we, we can say. The, the resounding um, success of the Labour Party here in the UK uh, can you imagine that uh, in 19, 2019, the conservat uh, conservative have won most of the seats in Parliament? They, they are down 2009 seats, and they only have won 121 seats. This is uh, something that was uh, quite um, unthinkable a few years back. So I think the politicians have to uh, put themselves into question and ask themselves, are we doing really what the people want? I think, mm -hmm. can I ask you a question? Yes. I think Eric is on to something, however. There's a massive, it seems, resistance to globalization. And that's true in this country as well. There's a return to the idea of, uh, in this country, of America first. Um, which has been interpreted as kind of out of control nationalism. But I believe that Americans really don't see globalization as anything that has helped anyone in our own country. For instance, all these wars are clearly not in America's interest. And I think probably the elections here, as well as in Europe, I think Europeans probably feel the same way. An end to all these wars which are draining every national budget of all of its money. I, and I see this in the election primarily of Jeremy Corbyn in, uh, in England. And in France, I'm wondering as well, is there a, a, a reaction against the war in Ukraine um, and against wars in general, which dragged France down, which dragged down the UK and dragged down the United States of America. And could you comment on that? Or what do you think? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think you, you got a good point here. Uh, the majority of the European people and mainly the UK citizen people in Britain are against war because the war is not serving the people. It's only serving some interest uh, that uh, the people are not benefiting from. 
So it's it's okay to say that uh, uh, the result of this election in the UK are also a reminder to the politician to listen to what the people really, really want. And let's say that uh, there has been many, many rallies here in the UK uh, against the war. It's not the very first time. It's been happening yeah. ever since uh, the invasion of Iraq. But those voices are not being heard in Parliament. So the way for them to actually sanction the politician is to vote for smaller parties, yeah. hoping that the smaller parties and the independent like people like Jeremy Corbyn will be the voice in Parliament and make people realize that the war is not serving their interest, but it's only for the interest of the rich and the interest of some industrialized uh, uh, tycoon here in the UK and elsewhere. In, in, in France, uh, uh, the rise of uh, the, uh, the Marine Le Pen and her political uh, party was uh, also you know, stigmatized as uh, a, a, a way of bringing anti-immigration. But do you think that immigration is the only real issue here? Because I see also that immigration is being, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's weighing on the people. I don't, I don't know if it's, it's good to wish that someone leaves his country in Africa you know, and, and, and go through, go through uh, the, the ocean, can die over there just to get some peanuts in, in Europe. Uh, maybe uh, 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 the Europeans are also saying that, you know, uh, immigration is not the answer. Uh, surely, immigration, immigration has been uh, actually used by many political parties and many countries to uh, try to hide the failure to right. bring about real change to people's life. Let's say that immigration is not the problem here. Immigration is for what people, uh, economic uh, people are saying. Immigration is a very good thing for every country. We can abide by the law as immigrants, but it's also important that the politicians recognize that immigration is a good thing for many, 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 many European countries. So the point that they're making about immigration, I think is really anachronic and uh, it just, the, the, it just trying to hide uh, the failed politics that they're not being able to address properly. So immigration is being manipulated uh, uh, for the profit of those people because in any, any country, when the migrants arrive in the country, they work, most of them work, even when they are not uh, legalized, they do work on the ground. And all this work that are um, done by the immigrants serve the country economy. It could be the black economy, but it's still an economy that will help the country uh, absorb not only um, the employment uh, uh, problem, but also give a plus into the GDP of the country. But you know, uh, is it so, is it fair? Is it I, fair I, to I wish? Think the, the, yeah. the, so, so, sorry to sorry to step in. I think uh, the the resounding the resounding and the, the necessity for the uh, the left parties in France to uh, come together in order to block uh, Marine Le Pen and uh, uh, his party a uh, party sorry to come into Parliament and, and into Matignon is a weakening that should uh, sound all across Europe. But immigration should not be manipulated only for, uh, the, um, uh, for the purpose of coming into power. Because even when those people will come in power, they will have to deal with those migrants who are working. And I don't think that uh, a country like the UK will be able to expel about 356,000 migrants that are working here legally. Well, I hope that they can't do that, that's for sure. <laughs> but I have another question well, about... Let me tell you something. Uh, Sir Sir, uh, Sir Sir Timer, the new prime minister, has said on the second interview that he has given to the BBC that he will revoke the systematic uh, removal of uh, immigrants that have been decided uh, 
uh, shamefully by uh, the Conservative Party with the deal to uh, send the migrants and everyone wishing for better life in the UK, send them back to uh, um, Rwanda, uh, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal. He has said that he will not be doing this. And this is something that uh, we can take as a victory because this is someone who also understand how people live and how people work because he himself is a, a, a child of uh, a very long uh, um, uh, lineage of uh, immigrants here in the UK. Yeah, did you? Yeah, uh, but uh, on the immigration problem, uh, Manix, uh, I heard also that people are fed up with I mean, people don't seem to understand that the wars that are yes, being, you know, exactly. propagated around the world re result in this, you know, massive immigration. Uh, did you hear uh, during these elections uh, something about what to do with Africa, what to do with the global south? Um, are the British, uh, you know, aware that, you know, if their country continues to... Uh, uh, subjugate, you know, uh, uh, people around the world, there will be uh, a Depression, massive migration. Right. Yeah. But it's not only the British. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's the same thing here. The current ideology in the United States is that people are trying to get to the United States and flee their countries because their countries are, are pathetic and corrupt and so forth. And the other reason they're continually saying that people are trying to get here is because of the climate crisis. I want to ask you a different question. Aren't most people fleeing their countries because of war and because of crime? For instance, from Latin America, it's because kids are being put into gangs uh, or they're suffering from crimes. And those crimes are often the result of poverty. And so um, why isn't the United States concentrating instead, and maybe Europe too, on making those, or helping those countries become prosperous in the first place? Well, at least and, let them alone. You know, I mean, or, let, well, let wait a minute. Them, let yeah. them alone, for one thing. Yeah. Let, for instance, let Cuba alone, for one thing. But why isn't the United States more act, and Europeans more active in helping people in their own countries stay there and become prosperous? instead of causing wars in those countries. That's true in Africa, for instance, and in Syria. Um, it's the United States and the Europeans' continual, I think, perpetuation of war that causes people like immigrants to leave. I might be wrong, but that's what it appears to me. I don't know. Well, I, I think you know, you know mistaken here. Uh, most of the war waged around the, the world are uh, mainly because of um, of resources, right? Yes. So um, the West is not really uh, willing to let um, Africa, uh, Asia, and um, all those countries where those uh, uh, resources are abundant to prosper, because that will mean that they will have to deal equal to equal with these people. So the war they're waging against Africa and the rest of the world is because of resources. It's oily, uh, provocative war. They need oil, they need uh, um, uh, raw materials, and those raw materials are mainly uh, found in Africa. And because they don't want to pay the right price. Today we're talking about fair trade. It's one of the things that uh, Europe and uh, uh, the U.S. should think about is how to deal equal to equal with those countries. Can you imagine the U.S. president talking to his, um, uh, his homologue of, uh, uh, of an African country, uh, addressing, addressing him as Mr. President? But can you imagine that happening with the French system? They are talking down to uh, African presidents as if they were some kind of uh, a buffoon people. So uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, I think the war that we're seeing all around the world is not uh, like it used to be. Is not a war for identity like it, it was with uh, uh, Israel and, uh, and the Nazi, but it's a war of raw material and resources. Yes. And those resources are mainly abundant in on in the African soil. And this is one of the reasons why um, 
the West is uh, waging those wars to get the resources at uh, very, very, very uh, cheap. Uh, let's take the case of um, uh, Libya and uh, Syria. The oil there, when there is war, nobody is uh, concerned about uh, protecting the wealth of the country. You are more down to protect your life. So in the meantime, the West and its allies are pumping the wealth out of those countries that are in war and uh, uh, destroying the country to come after and propose a rebuilding and a plan Marshall. So when they propose this kind of new plan Marshall to those African countries, this will keep the African countries in uh, and some kind of uh, static uh, position of uh, assisted country because the plan Marshall is not free. There, it, it has to be repaid. And the repayment and the uh, condition of the repayment with the mechanism put uh, upon those countries by the IMF and the World Bank are very, very disastrous. And they, I don't see th those African countries coming back from this position unless Europe and the US politicians realize that those countries have population that need to be fed as well, uh, as well as the US population and the Europe population, we all aspire for better life. And there will be no better life if we have no resources and if the wealth is pumped out of the country. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Thank you very much, uh, Manix. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, maybe the last question. People th thought that, you know, the citizens of Europe, you know, didn't get anything. And then all of a sudden we're seeing that, you know, citizens are voting, citizens are making their voice heard. Uh, is there a, a change that you have noticed uh, within the electoral corp? You know, is there any uh, thing that is changing? Is it immigration? Is it the fact that you know now we are a more uh, uh, you know metis you know population in Europe? So that if you go uh, 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 knock on uh, on Palestinians back home in the UK, back home in France, you will see. Citizen that will uh, see pushback. Yeah. Will push back. Did you see that? Yeah, I have. I, ha I have definitely seen uh, uh, things like this. Uh, today, uh, I must say that uh, the result of uh, those uh, those elections are not down to uh, immigration only. I'm not saying that immigration has not played a part. What I'm saying is, it's not only down to immigration. It's mainly down to the difficulties that people are encountering today because of the war in Ukraine and, and the war in Gaza war in and uh, the, um, the, 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 the lack of resources for people to live decent life. So you can see that uh, those politicians have failed to bring about a real proposition and solution to the people. So what people have voted for is for politicians who are promising them better life. Immigration have played a very a significant part into those uh, uh, in those elections. People are more concerned about their well-being, their welfare, the health system, the education of the people, the security of those people who will, will go out and expect to be back at home and not being shot at. This is what concerns more the people. And um, we, we have to say that uh, the UK population is very much uh, misinformed uh, uh, about the, 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 the war in Gaza and elsewhere because of this uh, uh, prop propaganda media that we have uh, all over in, uh, in, in the West. They're not telling the truth to the people. The, the ones who are not afraid to go to the source of the information really know the case of the Palestinian people, they know the the the, uh, the problem that are so, uh, the African people are suffering, and the result is in the election. We can see that they want a change, they want the, a new direction, and we hope that the new government here in the UK and also in France with uh, the new formation, which is a. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the gathering of uh, many small left parties within the new front will bring about the change that we all aspire. Uh, for, for joining us. Thank you. This was uh, Manix Manteau uh, from London, a uh, political analyst, a uh, friend of mine. We went to school together in Abidjan. Yes, and uh, it's a good buddies of my brother Leopold, <laughs> who is also Who lives here in Montreal. Yeah, but now he's back to England to help his son uh, 
you know, who goes to school over there. Manix, thank you so much. Thank you. And then bravo les thank Anglais. You, thank you for <laughs> bravo les Français aussi. Bravo les Français aussi. aussi. Oui, oui, oui. Merci, merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Et merci à la prochaine. D'accord. Oui, oui, merci. Voilà, donc pendant que Manix, uh, Manix s'en va, he turns off his, uh, his, uh, his uh, computer, we can uh, maybe talk about what's going on here. In we the... can, yes, we can begin to talk about this uh, kind of a nefarious Supreme Court case, correct? Mm -hmm. That everybody's hair is on fire. Well, not everybody's hair is on fire, but many of the Democrats' <laughs> hair is on fire. A lot of hue and cry. For a lot of hue, <laughs> but, but only from certain parts of the political spectrum. You'll notice that, uh, right? So is it like, uh, I mean, Okay, Sandy. let me start by, yeah. I'm going to comment on the case, but I want to start by saying I'm one of the few people that I know mm. that actually watches Fox. I watch, I watch Fox. Fox too. I know, but that's very unusual these days. <laughs> we are carefully taught not to Ooh, watch right. Fox because that's the network of, I guess, the wild-eyed Republican Party. And sometimes it is. Mm. Correct, but not totally. Okay, I also watch, though, CNN mm -hmm. and MSNBC. So I watch both the left media, mm -hmm. which is the Democratic Party, CNN and MSNBC are kind of the voice of the Democratic Party, and Fox is the voice of the Republican Party, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. And one of the reasons that you and I are committed to a different kind of journalism is journalism should be nonpartisan. Yeah. You know, nonpartisan. It shouldn't be connected to either party. It should be independent. And that's why I think citizens are making journalism rather than depending on these partisan networks. So if we had to break down what happened uh, in, this in, case? Su in this case, what exactly okay. you know, the Supreme so Court the came up The Supreme to? Court was asked to decide on whether or not the President of the United States had immunity or kind of forgiveness for any crime or any action that that President took within his official capacity. That's been decided before. Um, but anyway, in this case, the Republican were actually arguing that uh, the President should be immune in that president's official capacity doing official acts and not immune in crimes that he or she were committing on, in their personal lives. Yes. Okay, so that's to me what the court decided. The court decided that a president is pretty much immune from anything he does within his role as the president. To me, it was a statement of what already exists. As you know, and as I know, the president commits enormous crimes every day yeah. in terms of war. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, we, the president of the United States has been accused many times of war crimes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but when is he criminally responsible for those acts and when it isn't he? And the court pretty much decided that within his official capacity, doing official acts, pretty much he can't be prosecuted. That's awful to me. It's not a good thing for me personally, but it right. is the way the, things yeah. have been yeah. for a very long time. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. The Republicans don't, I mean, the Democrats don't mention this. While President Obama was in office, I was horrified that he, he was committing assassinations of U.S. citizens yes. abroad in other countries. Mm -hmm. An imam, a holy man, who Obama doesn't like kind of what he was saying. I think he was uh, in, perhaps, in, he was in one of the Arab countries. Yemen? He, I don't think Yemen, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But anyway, he, I could look that up. I'm sorry I didn't happen to think of that. But anyway, he was, he was talking the way that he shouldn't talk mm -hmm. in accordance with the President of the United States. Probably anti-American, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he was assassinated, and everybody knew it. He was assassinated by the United States. But, but uh, Cindy, it's okay, but wait a minute. Uh -huh. He was also his kid was part of that, and the kid, a 16-year-old kid, was also killed in that attack. It was in Yemen, yeah, yeah. So, but Cindy. Okay, but mm -hmm. to go on, and then mm -hmm. ask me anything okay. you want. He, w I mean, he was immune. Obama never was prosecuted, and the family of those people tried to at least do something about the fact that it, was made, it wasn't a war crime, really. We weren't at war. 
but they couldn't do anything because it was Obama and he was acting as the president of the United States. End of story. So why is why then are the Republicans hair? I mean, the Democrats hair <laughs> on fire about what the president is allowed to do? Yeah, I mean, it's been like this for a long time. But right. how is it then? I mean, is it easy or how can you uh, distinguish official duties? You can't. And that's what, the pres that's what the court said, that the trick in all of this is interpreting when it's an official act and when it isn't. Does the president, for instance, have the right to assassinate his opponents? Does he have the right to uh, kill people and argue that it's within his official mm -hmm. acts? The, the, what the court said, essentially, as I understand it, was that there's this gray area that has to be determined how far a president can go and when is it an official act and when it isn't. But that, to me, has been the way it's been, been the same really ever since, I think, World War II and the rise of the Central Intelligence Agency and the rise of the National Security Act, which gives the president enormous amounts of power in his official capacity. But like uh, those who are against this ruling are saying, for example, with the case of uh, uh, January 6th, yeah. you know, was the president acting in the capacity of First a president? First of all, I think that those people, what was the, I don't even know what the president was doing yeah. on January 6th. Okay. They, you'll notice how partisan that discussion is. Mm. That discussion is saying he did this insurrection. There's been no criminal finding that he did anything. No criminal finding. I'm not certain he's been accused of a crime. And all I know is that he has a big mouth, that guy. Mm -hmm. President Trump has a big mouth. And he probably tried to get Mike Pence to do something about the Electoral College. Is that a crime? He hasn't been convicted of anything. They're trying. It's a, it's a partisan um, attack in a way. The Democrats are saying that he participated in an insurrection. The Republicans are saying he did not. I don't know what the truth is. He has not been convicted of anything to do with it. Practically, it's difficult to, uh, <laughs> to yeah. you know, solve. But on uh, a moral standard, no, Sandy. Okay. Like <laughs> assassinating. Yeah. Uh, but all this can, does it give to the president enormous yes, power yes. with it? Can it put like the, the balance of power in, uh, in question? Look at the president of the United States. It's almost has, a monarch. No, but he has <laughs> enormous power. power. And he can't, I mean, but this, the part that I get so upset about is this has been the case for a long time. And where are the opponents to that when their party is in power? Mm. When Obama's in power, do you hear the Democrats ranting and raving about it? When Trump is in power, do you hear the Republicans ranting and raving about it? No. What I'm arguing is this whole discussion is politically partisanly based. Okay. Is there a chance that, you know, uh, a reform of uh, uh, all this could happen, but serenely? But what? But it has to be in, like, in a more serene ambience, uh, uh, atmosphere rather than political? Because it can't Look be. Look yeah. politics in this country are poison right now mm -hmm. on both sides. And they, uh, I think politics in this country are too much determined right now by how people feel. And if they feel hatred, I'm not a Trump fan mm -hmm. or I'm not a Biden fan or not. Mm -hmm. I think I re regard the world realistically. However, people have hated Trump so much that that's determined their politics too much. That they didn't even notice that Biden was... Uh, yeah, right. To, okay, to, but that's a different <laughs> subject, but I want to get into that. Yeah, yeah. Right. But this case, they've accused uh, Trump, for instance, of insurrection. Did he really do it? And they've allowed that to color everything else. They allow their hatred to color everything else, including the interpretation of this case. Mm. Right? They're saying that Trump really has too much power. And that, and that this case gives Trump too much power. Well, the case also might give Obama too much power, but 
What I'm arguing is that it's not, should not be partisan. Mm -hmm. The fact is that the President of the United States might have too much power. And that's true no matter who's in power. And that power has lasted and been in place really since World War II and the Cold War. A, a power that even uh, allows him to choose, to pick who is at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I guess I mean, so. But uh, that has to go through. Cindy, I would like to know more. How can a, in a democracy, you know, a it's president not. pick a Supreme Court to his taste? It, can, it can't. It has to go through hearings in Congress. I mean, institutionally, the United States institutionally is fairly sound. Mm -hmm. It's institutions. People. No, the court is fairly sound. The Congress is a fairly sound institution. Even the presidency is fairly sound institution. The fact is that all of those institutions have been corrupted by partisan politics, mm. all of them. Mm. And that is a damn shame. Because if you look at the U.S. Constitution, it is one of the best constitutions and probably one of the only constant and the oldest mm -hmm. in the world. And it has been corrupted by our political leaders in both parties. In Europe, yeah. small parties were able to make yes. a strong change. Yes. I mean, a significant maybe, change. maybe, but at least they're viable. Yes. They, and then they have their voice heard and they can even shift the balance. But, but uh, right. You know it, why? Yeah. Small parties cannot su succeed, at least with the presidency, because of the Electoral College. Mm. That is the one institution that, more than any other institution, has ruined American democracy. Is there a chance that institution no, be get taken away? No, I don't think away? so. Why? I don't know why. Because, they, they, because of amendments. the entrenched powers of the uh, elite. Primarily, I don't know why the Electoral College arose from slavery. Mm. Slavery has been abolished, thank God. I don't know why we still have an Electoral College, but it prevents, for instance, a state like Vermont, three electoral votes. Mm -hmm. If the people choose by one vote in the general election to elect, for instance, Biden, all the and if the vote goes that way by one. All three electoral votes, though, go to that per that person. It doesn't divide it. Even though the, the general election might be 49 to 51 percent, the 51 percent, the guy who won 51 percent, will get all three electoral so votes. So all these two, uh, 200 or some hundred years, that promise of uh, fair fairness yeah. and democracy has not been uh, no, In the electoral college, really gives rise to skepticism about the but fairness of the election. But it escalates down to the no, other matters. No, 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 matters, it doesn't you know. really. Yeah. The elections, I would think, of the Congress are fair enough. They're ruined by the elites and all the money that they give to certain uh, candidates. But their elections, I mean, but, the ele but the president yeah. is elected by the Electoral College. That is a problem. But if the Supreme Court and then the, the next, I mean, maybe the next president, if Donald Trump is re-elected. It looks like he very well might be. Let's get into that. <laughs> so, so if he's the next president, he will be so happy because he is himself, you, I know is a big mouth. He's bragging about, you know, having a nice Supreme Court. He got one, <laughs> didn't he? Yeah. Okay. So is it, is it here fair? I mean, is no, he got a that balanced Supreme, power? He got the Supreme Court because he won fair and square. He nominates judges, and then those judges were passed by the Congress. Let's look at that. It, but the know. Congress was favorable to him. Yes, of course. So what? So, I mean, this is so... Um, <laughs> Guess what? That's it's, politics. Oh, well. So is politics mm -hmm. fair? <laughs> Politics are the result of majoritarian rule. But you either take case, it or not. Yeah, okay. Majoritarian rule. Here, in, for example, in France, you have two uh, round of elections. Yeah. But here, you come first, you get it. That's right. You come first, you get it. Okay, that's the U.S. Tough. Go to France. <laughs> no, I understand. But even people in the U.K. who are, you know, also the same kind of, you know, type of elections, are, lo are hoping that they can have something like in France. People also in France would like so to have the So let those countries change it. Yeah, maybe there would be, uh, maybe the... the no, the <laughs> I'll tell you what would happen. Yeah. What will happen if you truly challenge power mm -hmm. in France, in England, 
in the United States or really in Iran or anywhere else. The elites are going to try to stop you any way they can. Any way they can. The only people, the only thing that changes politics is grassroots Good. citizens. Because uh, so far I haven't seen much difference between no. the and Republican I don't, I don't, and Democrats. Right. I mean, Correct. They, they, Correct. They, 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 they are, you know, a grand... Uh, themes. Especially on the issue of war. Yeah. They're both the same. Always. Okay. Lastly, I want to tell you one example mm -hmm. of presidential power mm -hmm. that was probably the worst exercise of presidential power that I can think of. And that was when President Truman decided unilaterally to use nukes against Japan. He did that unilaterally. Unilaterally? Yes. Never so went through Congress. Never <laughs> so, went through Congress, yes. and that was in 1945. But never went to Congress. Nobody, you know. I'm uh, not certain people in Congress it? even knew it. Yeah. Was did he get prosecuted about that? No. Did he get criticized about that? No. Maybe no. he get even. Celebrated. In fact, my he brother. I remember. I remember my brother. <laughs> good for Harry Truman. Give it to those Japanese. Yeah. Ooh, not me, man. Uh -huh. I knew yeah. it was a disaster. Yeah, I mean, and all these assassinations across the globe, you know, or, uh, you know. Yeah, I think that, uh, but there's no chance that the president here the will chance have his is power be, Wait a minute. The chance comes from people uh, below the government. But us, how can they, us. How can they be? By, if they cannot okay, have a party. Or organizations. The people in this country, the people, mm. changed the course of the Vietnam War. Mm. Stopped it. It was protest, it was voting. But also the U.S. wasn't And winning. guess what? Yes. And also it was the result of the grassroots efforts of the Vietnamese people. Both. They beat us. This wall is not a fair... It fair is drama. fair if citizens take their power. But unfortunately citizens... How, how then? Maybe grassroots journalism. Because yeah. it's so difficult, and Mannix was saying it like uh, from England, all the medias. That's are, why we have to make. Okay, Eric, mm. I've told you this a million times. That's why citizens have to make their own media. And that is what's happening across the United States. There is a whole branch, even at UVM, of citizen journalism, stuff like what we do. We're the ones who have to make journalism. I said something that I believe heartily. We have three major cable networks, correct? CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. Most people don't watch both, mm -hmm. or all three. Mm -hmm. They watch what they choose to agree with. All right, however, none of them cover, really, stories of the world. The only journalist that does that really is Democracy Now! and Amy Goodman. She concentrates on citizen journalism. We should do that too. Mm. Mm. We have to make our own media. Mm. Those three cable networks are partisan network networks. The two of them are really democratic <laughs> networks and Fox. And then, and then I remember I was on the plane and watching Fox News, and then the lady next to me was horrified. I know. You are black. How can you watch? <laughs> what did you tell her? I what said, did you tell her? I said, I watch, I watch them all. I know. And what did she say? <laughs> she said, oh, my God, how could you? And, and then That's what all I, my friends yeah. say to me. Oh, you just watch Fox. Well, I don't just watch Fox. I watch all three. Oh, yeah. However... I do watch Fox, that's true. Mm. And the best debate on this subject of the Supreme Court case was on Fox, and it was done by a professor of law at uh, uh, George Washington University by the name of Jonathan, I, I think Jonathan Turley. I'm not certain of his first name. He had a real analysis. It was countered by lawyers on CNN. I also watched those too. Mm -hmm. But like he said, look at this has been the case that the, this has been the law for a very long time, that the president has immunity in official acts. He doesn't have immunity in his personal acts, but the areas get gray. Mm. All right. It, I mean, I, uh, so beside the uh, uh, grassroots organizations, is there something within the system that can... Oh, I mean, I'm not sure because you said that when the Democrats are here, they won't go back to this issue because, you know, 
Exactly. No, they won't. If they win the next election, do you think that they're really going to criticize their own president for what's happening in Gaza? The United States has been accused seriously of war crimes, war crimes on the part of the United States for assisting giving weapons to the Israel. They and they, their, their best ally of the Middle East is Israel. Mm. Are we going to really say that the president of the United States should not be assisting the kind of the massacre of the people of Gaza? They won't do that. Mm. They'll say it's you know okay. And on the other hand, if the Republicans get elected, they're going to do the same thing, too. Mm. It's, I mean, that's what no, I'm saying. No Every, third party to... Uh, there's no third party that's viable because, of, in terms of the presidency, mm. because of the Electoral College. We could have third party politics. So we do in this, yeah. in this state, we do. Mm. We have, you know, for better or for worse, we have sort of a Republican party, not in the city of Burlington. They're gone in this. But we have a Republican party in the state house. We have a Democratic party in the state house. And we have the Progressive Party. Mm. None of which I agree with, totally. Mm. But I'm glad we have three parties. Yeah, because at least you know... Like uh, David Zuckerman is our lieutenant governor. Governor, He's a progressive and a Democrat. Mm. There are essentially three. I don't think that's enough. But anyway. All right, Cindy, I think... Uh, we've covered... Oh, but lastly, this thing about... <laughs> <laughs> the biggest issue to me right now is are the democrats going to keep biden in place are they okay yeah, yeah. okay now this is what, again because i watch fox i have known because i watch fox and they show biden at his worst mm -hmm. and they've done it for years i know of biden's handicaps and i've known him for a very long time so for them to act surprised yeah, that's uh, that's. It's really totally nice. disingenuous. It seems to me they have tried to cover it up mm -hmm. for a very long, long time, time. It appears to me. Yeah. And what are they going to do now? now. You do, tell me. Could, do you think that is possible? That you know uh, Biden could. I mean, is there a way to force a candidate out? It's just up to him. That's what they're saying. Against and if they don't get him out. Then they're going to argue that Trump won because because Trump's unfair or something. They, the Democratic Party, gave us Biden. They are they are probably stuck with him. Mm -hmm. But it's their fault if Trump wins. It seems to me. I don't want Trump to win, but that's what they've done, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't see how Biden can win. Do you? People think that, you know, it's not about, you know, uh, the person in front of you. It's about the ideas. It's but the person in front of you, if he's handicapped so much mm -hmm. that he can't even say a, a total sentence. Yeah. Is it? I mean, uh, on that, you sometimes, you know, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> go against me. Is it that the... the I go the against US, you a lot. <laughs> the US, you know, political system is, you know, uh, uh, animated by older folks. Uh, folks. By what? No! I mean, you know? Is Look it? at, okay, no, and I do argue against that. Yeah. I resent deeply the yeah. fact that everybody says that Biden's handicaps are because he's old. Look at Bernie Sanders. Yeah, but Bernie, wait, no, 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 but wait, wait, Bernie Sanders finish. could also, you know, let me would finish. it be here? Would it be old good for people, Bernie Sanders also to stop now are and prepare not, no. the relief? Old people I mean, are not, no, not necessary. No, yeah. I'll talk about that after yeah. I make my point, yeah. okay? Uh -huh. Old people are not necessarily handicapped. Old people like Bernie, or like me, I don't think of myself as having no. dementia. The problem with Biden is that he is seriously handicapped. That is the problem. And that he's incompetent because of it. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah. So if they put up Biden against Trump at this moment, 72% of the voters think Biden should not uh, run. Mm. It's not because he's old. It's because he probably have, cannot do the job. Have, now, yeah. you can ask me about Bernie. Mm. 
-hmm. Bernie is capable, competent, and I, old. I agree with okay. that, but you know, it's but a culture. Are, okay, it's a is, culture. This is Bernie a country. could be a good advisor. This is, this is what you're asking. The elders, as we this say. This is what you're yeah. asking. Mm -hmm. He is a good advisor. First yeah, of he all. could be a good advisor. He is now, and he should stay where he is because of his voice, his values, and his politics. Yes, Nobody he should Nobody else be, can have the same okay. voice as Bernie? Yes, and can he, he should, can, he should he, train he them. He didn't train okay. anybody yet? No, he has, of course. He's Who are they? Emma Mulvaney Stanek, yeah. for one. Uh -huh. For so one, none of David Zuckerman, take, none of for them another. Can take up, because also it's the signal that is, you send to the young okay, people. Okay, you advise For and the train, young right. people to, be, to, to, to rise I to power. I couldn't agree more. The older folks should be retired. I, that's what I don't agree with. In, in Europe, people are fighting to retire at 60. The social yeah, system... because of their crappy have, jobs. No, have not crappy jobs. Here, they have more crappy jobs. I know. <laughs> I no, know. It's because and people maybe should be there, allowed there's, to retire there's a, there's from a, there's them. A less aggressive capitalistic system that allows people to aspire to a more, I mean, rewarding life. Here you yeah, find that's, that's, elders hey. that are forced to work till they to work on the okay, job. That's, that's bad. And that's the politicians Bernie. are the ones who are sending that signal. I would be happy to see Bernie Sanders prep a, young, a younger person and, you know, be part of the advisor who, because... Hey, you would be happy. Yeah. I wouldn't. Ah, okay. okay, I want right. Bernie to stay in power. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. Okay, so, we don't disagree. <laughs> no, no, we don't. Stay yeah. in mm -hmm. power, Bernie, and train others. That's when? my thought. When is he going to train us? He does all the time. Okay, we'll see. He we'll does see. all the time. We'll see. So we have three minutes left to continue this argument. Mr. It's Gerard interesting. Merrill. And yeah. you're no spring chicken either. Oh, I know, I know. That's why I don't do... I mean, I agree with you, but Sandy... Sandy, um, always. <laughs> the Sandy. We need to think about that, you know. No, you uh, need to uh, think uh, about uh, it. I've already thought about it. I have of, already of thought about political, it. Of the political, you know, Hey, uh, look apparatus. at what I do. I yeah. train a lot of young people. I agree with you. Okay. That's what you should do. But would you go for, uh, for, uh, for to no. become president? No, there's something. No. A president has to be on the go. Has to, it's a yeah. physical job. That's it's why also, Bernie should uh, be president. Okay, Bernie has more stamina than, than uh, you know, uh, Biden. Yes. I, I agree. Sandy. Talking about a younger or an older president, Iran. I know. Let's elected. Yeah. Okay. President, yeah. Thank heavens. Who is the like the right. oldest president of Iran in history? Oldest or youngest? Old, he's sixty-nine. Yeah. Good. And then they said he's the oldest person elected and as president and in I Iran. I have great hope for him. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I saw a woman. Uh, who was living in Paris, and she was the director of Persepolis. Uh -huh. She's a very important person, an Iranian woman living in Paris. She wasn't hopeful at all. I'm hopeful. And she kept on saying, because of the, po like you say, because the power structure behind the president mm -hmm. is so strong that they're going to try to destroy him. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I still am hopeful. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still hopeful, hopeful because, you know, anyway, if he comes to power, it means that internally they are, you know, maybe... Voices and it means that, that women, to... women might be able to lead a better life. Yeah, right but now, also maybe you know the Ayatollahs got the yeah, message no, from the be. youth, uh, got the message from the population that is you know fed up with you know. That's another interesting election that I wish we had more time to mm, cover. Yeah. Actually, we'll come back to it. Okay, great. <laughs> the, 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 we'll, we'll see how the U.S. Yeah, will and we'll probably to argue about that too. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, and yeah. we had a nice uh, program today. I don't, you, th you think so? <laughs> Big shot. Because, because I had, I had the, the, the luxury to tell uh, uh, Biden and Bernie Sanders to retire. Uh, you did. <laughs> I'm not telling Bernie to retire. No way. Are you kidding? No Thank way. Thank you so much and see you next time for what's going on. Yeah.